Okay, so welcome everyone and uh, thank you very much uh, for being uh, here. This is the first uh, webinar of a series uh, on control education organized by the IFAC Technical Committee on Control Education. I am Antonio Visioli, I'm the chair of the IFAC Technical Committee 9.4. And this series of webinar is organized in cooperation with the IEEE Technical Committee on, on Education, chaired by John Edengren, who I thank a lot for his uh, cooperation. And we are very lucky that the first uh, speaker is Brian Douglas. Everyone knows him, so I will not spend too many words in introducing you. The title of the webinar is Don't Reinvent the Wheel, Making Use of the Best Control System Resources. And uh, just a short uh, announcement, uh, the next uh, webinar will be on November the 30th uh, at uh, 4 p.m. Central European time. And the seminar will be given by Jose Luis Guzman of the University of Almeria, who will talk about uh, automatic control within, with interactive tools. So please save the date, November the 30th. And now I give the stage to Brian, who will uh, talk about, again, don't reinvent the wheel, making use of the best control system resources. Uh, there will be time for a few questions after the webinar. You have to raise your hand and I will allow you to switch your microphone on. Thanks, Brian, a lot for being here. The stage is yours. All right, yeah. Thanks, Antonio. Um, this is exciting. I'm, I'm excited that you're starting this webinar. Um, I appreciate that you've invited me to give a talk. And I didn't know that Jose Luis has given the next one. Um, so a plug for that, I think that'll be exciting. Um, Jose always has really good, great stuff. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Awesome. Yeah, thanks Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I want to talk about what the title is, which is just making use of the best control system resources, things that are already out there um, on the internet, most of them for free, uh, that you don't have to go off and create your own all the time. Um, real quick, um, uh, just real quick about me, my experience is in systems engineering and spacecraft guidance, nav, and control. So I've had 15 years um, in the experience building hardware, building software, mostly for satellites um, and, and for, uh, you know, controlling satellites, pointing, guidance, nav, and, and things like that. For the last, uh, well, I don't know now, it's been a long time, six years full time, but it's been I don't know, 12, 13 years part-time, I've been making YouTube videos. Um, I now work at MathWorks and I make the MATLAB Tech Talk YouTube series for them. Um, and I've been doing that for a long time. We've been doing it for probably five years, making this, this Tech Talk series. Um, and you can find all of the videos. They're on YouTube, they're at mathworks.com uh, for free if you haven't seen any of that stuff. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to draw and, um, and I make these control theory comics. You, maybe several of you guys have seen them. They're for the IFAC newsletter that comes out every other month. Um, actually, it's, it's really for the email introducing the newsletter that goes out. Uh, but I think it's fun to try, to try to come up with some different ways to create educational content. Um, and so hopefully people are using these to help teach some of their concepts and bring a little bit of humor uh, into their courses and things. Uh, the other thing I do is I, I, I also drew the map of control theory. That was a long time ago. Um, but the whole idea behind that map was that I wanted to take a lot of different um, concepts. Well, not concepts, but they're all somehow related to each other and organize it um, into a way that at least made sense to me and then hopefully makes sense to other people as well. And that's something that I, I really enjoy doing, which is just taking ideas and organizing them, whether they're into a video to teach something um, into a map like this, or to take uh, a bunch of different resources and organize them into something useful, which is sort of the point of this talk here. Um, and uh, a bit of a spoiler, I'm working on a few more maps um, that I'm not going to say much more about, but hopefully before this year is out, we'll be able to share some more stuff, which I'm pretty excited about. All right, so on to the talk about organizing these resources. I guess there's three main points that I want to make. Um, and the first is that using different types of resources can make you a more effective teacher. Uh, and there's a, a huge caveat with that. 
Um, and, and that is that I'm not an educational researcher. I mean, you saw my background. Um, I don't study pedagogy um, and I don't even really teach in the uh, traditional sense, you know, live in front of students, getting feedback from students and all that stuff. So, so what I'm presenting here is an opinion. Um, and, and so please take everything I say here with a grain of salt. Use some things if it works for you. Don't if it doesn't. Um, but I want to talk about using resources to teach. The other thing I want to talk about is that there are millions and maybe more of resources online. Um, and it's it is perfectly great to create your own new resources, create videos, create blog posts, um, cre you know, create apps, all of that stuff, which is great. I'm going to continue doing that. And I think if you have the desire to do that, you should continue to create new stuff because I think it's great. Um, but if you don't have the time or the desire or or for whatever reason, you don't have to create your own because there's just millions of stuff out there. It's ready to go. Um, the main problem I think with them is that since there's millions of them and they're dispersed throughout the internet, um, they take a long time to find. And and even if you do find it, take a long time to organize and figure out exactly how to use that resource to teach what it is you want to teach. Or on, on the flip side, if you're a learner, to find that resource to learn um, what you want to learn. So those are the three things I want to cover here. Um, and the first we're going to start with what is effective teaching, at least again to me, what effective teaching is. Um, so I like this quote from Daniel Greenberg, who is, who was anyway, a, an actual education researcher. Uh, and he says that you can't make someone learn something and you can't even really teach someone something. They have to want to learn it. And if they want to learn it, then they will. And um, and I fully believe this because as educators, we don't have a lot of one on one time with the students. Uh, so I feel like at least some of that time should be spent getting them to want to learn, um, you know, getting them to want to go and read the book for hours, to go and practice problems for hours, to work in groups with their peers um, and to do all of that stuff that they have to do outside of that one on one learning learning time. And so if they're motivated to learn, I think they're in a much better starting point to go off and spend all of that time to, to sort of learn on their own. And so I think motivation is a big part of effective teaching. And there's a lot of different ways you know, that we can motivate students, grades and graduating. I know at least in some of my classes, getting a good grade was, you know, in graduating and then getting a job was motivation enough. Um, but we can also frame the problem in a way that shows what understanding that particular concept enables. You know, what are you able to do with it? What other stuff are you able to do once you, you know, as a building block, once you understand this particular concept? Um, and sometimes we can just motivate people by just saying, look, this is this is just cool, right? Get them excited. Um, I mean, I watch a lot of, I learn a lot of things on YouTube that I will never use. It's not practical at all, but I'm excited about it because it's presented in such a way that is motivating. So that's the first half. I think the other half though is like, you know, is the student has to be able to retain that information. You know, it's it's not enough just to motivate them and send them off and transfer all of this knowledge to them and then have them forget it, you know, of after the semester or or later on. Um, so we've got to figure out a way to to present it in a way that retention is is done. Um, and if you guys don't know Derek Muller, he runs the YouTube channel Veritasium. It's fantastic. Um, he talks uh, a little bit about education, but mostly about physics um, and he's a great, great presenter. And he actually did his PhD thesis on effective ways to teach physics through video. Um, and he has this uh, quote, well, it's a paraphrased quote about cognitive effort. And he says, with animations compared to static images, you might not have to invest as much mental effort, which makes it less memorable. Um, and so his idea there is that videos can make things really easy to grasp in certain situations, right? Animations, if we make plots and we're spinning plots around, doing all of this stuff that makes the, the, the viewer say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm understanding this, I'm getting it. But if they're not having to really put a lot of mental effort into it, to think, to understand, to really grasp the concept, um, it's you know motivating and interesting, but it might not be memorable. They might forget it right after the right after the back, so uh, right after they finish watching it. So, so presenting information in a way that that 
makes it more memorable um, is important. And he talks a little bit about that. And he also says that we should be addressing misconceptions. He says, start with the misconceptions. If you just say the correct stuff, the viewers don't learn. They just become more confident in the stuff they thought before. Um, and his example there was like how trees get most of their mass. He said, if I just come out and say they get most of their mass from the air by pulling carbon out of the air, everybody will sort of nod along and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. And then, but if they already thought that they got it, you know, trees got it from the soil by sort of sucking up the mass from the roots, um, it, it may not be enough to push that misconception out of their mind. And then months down the line, they may revert back to that misconception. But he says, if you start with that and ask them, what do you, where do you think the mass of, you know, the tree mass comes from mostly? And you address that misconception right off the bat by getting them to think about it. Um, that will be a better way to get them to retain that information. So on the retention side of things, we, you know, there's cognitive effort, addressing misconceptions, um, and then other things that, you know, we all know about, like repeating the same thing, you know, over the course of uh, an hour, days, coming back to it, that repetition can help with retention. And then just relating it to something that they know using analogies, uh, relating it to information that they already have can also help with retention. So we've got these two things, motivation and retention, that I think are really big pillars in education. Um, and once again, to come back to sort of the, the theme of this talk is that uh, there's resources that can help with both of those things that already exist. Um, and a resource to me is pretty much anything that has educational value. So these are videos, um, books, there's peer reviewed papers, there's blog posts, there's even answers on like Quora and, and other um, forums, virtual labs, hardware, software repositories, all sorts of stuff. Everything can be considered a resource. Um, and like I said, we can continue to create more resources. and I really hope we do, um, but there's millions of them out there of various quality and usefulness for sure. And so the question is, how do we sift through all of this and quickly find the things that are valuable? And just a little bit of a, a spoiler for where we're going. Um, I'm proposing one way here with resourcecm.org as to how to organize what already exists. And I'll get back to this in a second because for this to make sense, um, I think I need to take everybody here on a journey. But don't get too excited because it's just a learning journey. Um, this is the way that I think about learning for myself as well as for teaching other people which goes through this sort of six step process of introducing, motivating, attempting, learning, reinforcing, and exploring a particular concept. Um, and the concept that I wanna explore here is the discrete Kalman filter. I wanna walk through um, the way that I use resources to help people learn the, these you know, well-known wonderful equations, right? Um, and if you're anything like me, when you first started learning the Kalman filter, uh, like I did 20 years ago, it was a lot of just reading the book and trying to understand what all of this meant and how to apply it to something practical or how to uh, understand it in a way that made sense to me. Um, and when I wasn't reading the book, uh, for the most part, a professor was reading the book essentially to me in a class. Um, just, you know, their lecture notes were essentially the same thing. And I'd sit there and I'd try to grasp what all of these concepts were. Um, and maybe maybe that is the best way, you know, from a you know retention standpoint. Um, but I remember struggling a lot with understanding what was going on with the Kalman filter. So here's the way that I think about it now, and the way that I wish, you know, sort of I was introduced to the topic. And it starts with just an introduction. So what is an introduction to a topic? Um, I don't know if this meme is still popular or not, but I like it, so I'm gonna keep using it. Um, it's not rigorous mathematical proofs. It's not detailed information about a concept. It's just presenting the concept at a high level. <clears throat> it's just really just an introduction. The student doesn't even need to know that math is involved necessarily. Um, so for example, uh, I wrote an ebook for MathWorks called Multi-Object Tracking for Autonomous Systems and Surveillance Systems, which is kind of a mouthful. But the first several pages of this ebook was talking about introducing the Kalman filter. And, um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I do want to give you sort of the gist of the way that I set up this, this ebook is 
Um, I start with a question, which is, you know, how do we know the state of a system? How do we know how fast our car is going? How do we know the voltage of an electrical circuit? How do you know what time it is, right? How do we know the state? And uh, I, I would assume most people would say, well, we can measure it. We can measure the speed of our car with our speedometer. We can measure voltage with a meter. We can measure time, you know, at least see what time it is with a with a watch or or some other device. Um, but we also can know the state in a separate way, and that's through a model, through predicting what the state of the system will be. And the way that you know I think about that is if I asked you right now what time it was, and you looked at your watch and you said, "Oh, it's 4:37." And then we waited about a minute and I asked you again, I said, don't look at your watch this time, but what time do you think it is? I think most people would be able to guess that it was probably 438 or maybe 439. You know, there's some uncertainty there in the prediction, but if it's only been about a minute, very few people I think would say that it's 8 p.m. or one in the morning or anything like that, right? So we do have this way of predicting the state of a system without having to directly measure it every single time. The measurement can be noisy and flawed. Our prediction can be noisy and flawed. And this is what a Coleman filter is doing. It's taking that noisy sensor and that noisy measurement, and it's balancing it with um, our flawed prediction. And it's not just for silly things like telling time. We can apply this exact same concept to all sorts of stuff, like tracking an airplane. If we know or have an estimate of where the airplane was at its last time step, we can use a model knowing its speed and orientation and altitude and maybe um, environment, uh, the, the, you know, things about the environment, like the wind speed or something like that, whatever it is, we can have any kind of model to predict where the airplane will be at some future time step. And then we can measure the state of the aircraft using some sensors and, um, and figure out where we measure the state of the aircraft. Again, it's a noisy sensor, it's a flawed prediction, Coleman filter comes in there and corrects the state. And if we have a lot more uh, confidence in our prediction, then that corrected state is going to be biased up towards the prediction. If we have a lot more confidence in our measurements, then that corrected state is going to be biased down towards the measurement. But that's what the Coleman filter is doing. Um, and that's the end of at least my introduction before we get into any kind of math. It's just this is this is where the Coleman filter sits in the world. Um, and if you don't like my explanation, Tim Babb has a fantastic explanation um, on his blog on how Coleman filters works. And he uses pictures, which are these just like adorable little robots that he draws. And he explains the whole thing um, through pictures, which I think is fantastic. And if you don't like what Tim wrote, um, Tucker McClure from an Uncommon Lab has his own blog post that I think is fantastic that talks about how Coleman filters work. And there's animations and there's graphs that, that move. And he talks about the particle filter and the sigma point filter. Uh, and the extended Coleman filter and goes through the whole thing in a way that I think is really intuitive and really awesome. So there are lots of these examples out there. This is just three different sort of resources that I use to introduce the Coleman filter. And all of them, I think, are, are, are pretty great. Like you don't have to necessarily go and recreate it from scratch. So with the introduction out of the way, it's like, students, this is what the Coleman filter is. Um, I think the next step now is to Hook them, right? We got to motivate them. Why? Why should we even bother learning this thing? I know you told me what it is, but what's the what's the purpose? Um, and for this, uh, there's another YouTuber, Joe Barnard. He runs a, a channel called BPS Space. Awesome channel. If you don't know um, about Joe and what he does, you should go and subscribe to his channel. He does. Uh, he talks about engineering projects that he's working on, and mostly what he's doing is is model rockets. Um, and he does thrust vector control of these model rockets so he can get them to fly straight up. Um, in, in some projects, he tries to get them to land vertically like the booster stage of a SpaceX rocket. Um, really cool stuff. But in this video that I sort of spliced together here, I just wanna give you a sense of how he talks about the Kalman filter for the project that he's working on. The NAV computer is doing its own integration of the gyroscopes and accelerometers at 400 hertz on its own little I2C bus. I'm using a sort of asynchronous Kalman filter to get our position and velocity estimates with the accelerometer. And the asynchronous part is that while the prediction step of the Kalman filter is running continuously at 400 hertz, 
the update step doesn't run until we have new GNSS data, and that's a flexible amount of time. I wrote the filter primarily by using this book, which I will link below, and then I tuned it by spending a lot of time outside on my driveway. I used a little cart with Ava riding on it to go back and forth and see if our measurements matched up with the real world measurements in position and velocity. The filter also does live accelerometer bias calculations, which is a bit of a flex, but I worked really hard on it and it was very difficult to get right, so I have to tell someone. But it's mostly cool because it just means we can fly Ava for a very long time while it still gets accurate position and velocity estimates. Four, three, two, go sprint, go Ava. There it is, holding. That's it. I did it. <laughs> the straight up. GNSS system. Shoots, shoots. Oh, beautiful. All right. So that's just, you know, a snippet of the full video, but um, I find this sort of thing just incredibly motivating. If I had seen this as a student and realized, okay, there are some projects that I can do, maybe not. Um, you know, model rockets or something like that, but I can apply this Kalman filter right now to a project that I can do myself out of my home or apartment. Um, and so it's 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 just, you know, it, show, showing these types of things, these videos that people that are already using this concept, in this case, the Kalman filter for whatever project they're working on, I find really, really motivating. So if this was me, I'd be all amped up. All right, I'm ready. Um, I know what a Kalman filter is. I know how to use it. I don't necessarily want to learn it right away. I want to get in there and I want to attempt it. And again, this goes a little bit to sort of addressing misconceptions right off the bat is I want to get in there and I want to try it myself. Um, and again, nice thing is there's tons and tons of apps um, in virtual labs and real lab like hardware and all of these things that allow students to just get in there and just start moving dials and figuring things out. Um, Professor Rossiter has his control uh, community control toolbox, um, which is a number of different control apps that you can just download right into um, uh, MATLAB straight from the uh, um, from the add on page. And then there's another set of apps from Aachen University. Again, these are just sort of uh, gen not generic controls, but they're not necessarily common filter based, but I'm just saying that there are apps out there already free. You can just go and grab and you can just start playing with. Um, for things that are a little bit more <laughs> tied into common filter, uh, MathWorks has a, a virtual laboratory here that talks about the linear and extended common filter for a pendulum system. Whoops. Um, and and this is just a script that you can go through and it talks about this pendulum and swings back and forth and you can visualize it and you can change covariance matrices and you can do all sorts of stuff with it and see the effect um, on on the estimated uh, position of this of this pendulum. And uh, I and I created my own also right can't I guess we can't have too many resources. This one uses uh, um, Professor Hedengren's you know sort of famous temperature control lab. Uh, it's a Simulink based example um, and on the far right where it goes into that scope, the, the top signal is the estimated position, uh, I'm sorry, the estimated temperature of that comes out of the Kalman filter. Below that is the measured temperature that comes directly from the temperature sensor. Below that is the true temperature, which um, uh, comes actually from a nonlinear high fidelity model. It's not coming from the actual hardware. Um, and then below that is a lower fidelity linear model, and it's the exact model that's used in the Kalman filter. So we've got those four, and when you run the script, it, you know, run the Simulink model without it making any changes, it you know, kind of looks like this. And what I think is, is great about presenting all four of these at once is that you can zoom in on it and you can see, okay, the orange line or the red line is the truth. It's nice and smooth as the temperature is increasing. The uh, measured temperature is that blue line, which is noisy, and it's kind of bouncing all around, centered around the truth, but has a lot of variance in it. The model, which is the green line, is nice and smooth because we're modeling a, a smooth process, but it's got that bias in there because it doesn't understand some of the disturbances in the environment and things like that. So there's a there's a there's a bias there. And then the yellow line is the estimated temperature, which comes out of the Kalman filter, which is blending sort of that smoothness of the model and the 
bias freeness, I guess if that's a word, of, of the measurement. And so we're getting something that's much closer to the truth. And again, students can go in and change covariance matrices, can change noise parameters, can change the model and sort of see how all of that affects it. So just let them loose, go off, attempt it. There's a lot of resources out there that allow you to sort of just play with these different control concepts. At that point, at least for me, I'm ready to learn. It's like, look, I tried it. It was either easy and I want to know the details or it was hard and I want you to tell me how to do it for real. Um, and then this is sort of what I would consider the sort of traditional, um, you know, learning that that I had, you know, 20 years ago or so, which is the books, there's the lectures, there's peer reviewed papers, um, studying, you know, studying the actual equations and the theory itself. At that point, we have to reinforce it. It's, I don't think it's enough to just learn something once. You know, you need to do it and practice it over and over and over again. And a lot of times that's, you know, written exercises with homework um, and uh, and quizzes and tests and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but what's nice, you know, these, these days is that, like I said, there's a lot of virtual labs. There's also a lot of low cost hardware that's already available to do project based reinforcement, which is just being able to apply the theory on a real physical hardware. And this hardware is cheap and, um, and useful, and so students have access to it. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Takesh has the, these 3D printed laboratories that, that her team creates. Uh, Professor Hill has these simple and inexpensive hardware experiments that use the Arduino. Um, and then I've already mentioned the temperature control lab from Professor Hedengren. Um, that, that is great. And the, the nice thing about uh, what Professor Hedengren has created is that there's also a bunch of, of um, lecture notes and and uh, and uh, you know examples and things like that. So you can do a lot of different things with the temperature control lab. So there's this project-based reinforcement that that we can do, and the hardware already exists, and and it exists at a at a very low cost. After reinforcement, usually that's done, right? We've reinforced, we've we've quizzed the students. Let's move on to the next concept. And that's the same here. But occasionally you're going to want to do some self-learning on your own and explore more things. Um, and so you can also present things like if you want to continue sort of your journey on the Kalman filter, we're going to move on. But if you want to continue it, um, you know, go check out this blog by, by Tucker McClure. And you can learn about the particle filter, sigma point filter, extended Kalman filter, all of that. Um, if you want to watch a video, you know, I, I made a video on the particle filter. You can go off and watch that. If you want to go back to the source, you can go check out the, the original paper that that uh, Rudolf Kalman wrote on, on this filter. You know, so we can send students then um, to explore on their own to a, a bunch of different things. So whoops. So that's my that was my journey. Um, through the Kalman filter. And uh, there's a couple of problems with it. I jumped the gun here. So this is the first problem. Uh, the, the first problem is that it takes a lot of time. It takes time to find all of those resources. It takes time to organize them and to display them to the students and to do all of that stuff, much more than just you know standing up and doing lecture notes. And so I totally understand that, that, that there's a, a barrier there to using all of these resources. Um, but there's also another problem is that that's just one example of how to learn the Kalman filter, and it's the way that I like to learn about it, but it doesn't work for everyone, right? Um, everyone has a different approach to teaching. Everyone has a different approach to learning. So a second problem here is that uh, that that journey doesn't work for everybody. Somebody else might come in and create something else. And one of my colleagues at MathWorks, Melda, she has a completely different approach to teaching the Kalman filter. She created a five part video series. The first part's on why we use Kalman filters. The second one's on what state observers are. The third one's on what an optimal state estimator is. Uh, the fourth one's on the algorithms themselves that do that optimal state estimation. And the fifth one goes into nonlinear state estimators. And she says, after you watch those five videos, go off and take this um, Simulink on ramp, which will teach you sort of the basics of using Simulink. And then you can go and check out this Kalman filter virtual lab that she created that, that shows uh, the, the, the Kalman filter in action. It's the one I showed earlier where students can go in and make changes to the script and all that stuff. So 
totally different Coleman filter, totally different Coleman filter journey. Hers was on the top, uses those uh, whatever seven resources. Mine's on the bottom, uses a completely different set of resources. And almost certainly, if we asked a third person uh, to create a journey using existing resources, they would come up with something else. Um, they may say, "Oh yeah, I'm just going to pick and choose between what Melda put together and what I put together." Right. We'll start with my introduction blog. We'll watch Joe's awesome motivating video about the rocket. We'll watch Melda's great five-part series, um, video series on the Coleman filter. And then I wanna send people off and do some homework problems and try things on their own. That's a possible third journey. Um, more than likely, uh, it's gonna be something like this. You know, uh, An educator is gonna say, look, I've been teaching the Coleman filter for a long time. I already have my own introduction that I've created. I want to stay with that. I didn't know about Joe's video. I'm going to use that. I really like the way Melda talks about optimal state estimation in her video. It's short and I can just play that or have my students watch it. Um, I liked Brian's virtual lab on the Coleman filter, but then I'm going to go back to my regular lecture notes. I'm going to go back to my textbook. I'm going to go back to the way that I'm, I, I've always taught my class, right? So this could be another potential journey where existing resources fit in and amongst um, things that that are created uh, to fill in the gaps. So what we end up with here is if everybody is sharing all of their resources and it's all online, we just have this web of resources and connecting all of these resources are any infinite number of journeys through this this whole process. So I go back with that in mind to this question of how can we organize what already exists? And I think a good way of organizing is through journeys. It's through connecting good high quality resources into a journey and then allowing other people to mix and match starting from that journey with their own resources and then sharing from there so that we can keep building on all of this stuff. And that's the idea at least behind resourcing.org. Um, so Resourcium has three data types it's built on. There's resources, there's journeys, and there's topics. A resource, again, is any URL that has any kind of educational value whatsoever. That's all of the stuff we've talked about. A journey is just a structured list of resources. It's, it's connecting a subset of these resources in a particular order. And then a topic is just a subject, it's a concept, it's an idea, um, in this case, Coleman filter. And so resources are tied to topics, journeys are tied to topics um, as a way to classify uh, these resources and journeys and gives people a way to sort of hone in on exactly what they're looking for. And the way that I like to think about topics is as Wikipedia pages. If there is a Wikipedia page for something, that is a topic, and we should probably have something similar for a top, for an idea within control education. All right, now I wasn't sure how much time I was gonna have. I usually sort of do like a live demo here, um, but I thought I was gonna be running short on time. So I just recorded a real quick video showing Resourcium um, and I'm gonna stay with this. And then that way we'll have a little bit more time for sort of questions at the end. So I'm gonna play this video um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about Resourcium and then we'll finish it here. All right, if you go to resourcium.org, you're going to find yourself at this home screen. And from the search bar, you can search for a keyword like Coleman, and it's going to return the results for the resources that we have in the database that match that keyword. It also returns any journeys that have that keyword and any topics. So you can search for a control term and just see what exists across journeys, resources, and topics. You can also navigate directly to a topic using the Explore tab. And from a topic page like the Coleman filter one, we list out the resources and the journeys associated with it. So here you can see that we have the two journeys that I mentioned in the talk. And if I click on Melda's, you can see that the journey itself has all of the resources that Melda placed in here in the order that she feels that they should be viewed. Now, you can view everything in the database right now without any kind of account. 
you can just go check out all the resources that already exist at resourceteam.org. But if you do create an account, which you can do for free directly from the website, and then if you log in, you can then also save resources and journeys to view later. For example, back in the Coleman filter topic, I might save these three resources. And then when I go up to the My Items tab, I can easily come back to find the resources that I'm interested in. Now, if you do want to add resources to the database, or if you want to create your own journey, there's an additional step. I'm not just letting anybody from the general public add things into the database because I'm afraid that it'll just become a mess. But if you have a lot of good control resources that you know about, or if you want to try to create and share a journey and you would like write access, go down to the contacts page and send me a quick note. All right, yeah, so that's that's clearly a very, very quick overview of Resourcium. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the highlights. One is um, nothing is actually saved to Resourcium. They're just links. It's just a link aggregator. And so everything drives drives everybody back to the original content um, from, from Resourcium.org. And anybody can go there, find out all of the, the links. You can see all of the journeys that have been created, all of the resources that have been created or have been added. Um, and like I said, if you create an account, if you want, you can save items so that you can come back and find them easily later. Not not required. Um, but I am looking for people who are interested in adding additional resources. Right there's like I said, there's millions of them, and and it's impossible for one person or or a small team of people to add all of those resources and to create all of these journeys. And really, my my hope and my goal is to create something a little bit closer to Wikipedia, which is crowdsourced and crowd-led um, and crowd-moderated to create all of these resources and then have various people come in and create journeys. And those journeys that, like in Reddit, that are, are, that are better than others tend to float to the top and are easier to find. Um, poke around on the website, I have a lot of this stuff written down. I'm not gonna go into it anymore here. Um, and obviously feel free to, to send me a note if you have questions or suggestions or you know just want to say hi. Um, but since I am sort of hoping that one day this is, becomes a Wikipedia of sorts, uh, I figured we would um, you know compare to see where we stand at the moment against Wikipedia. So topics, like I said, Wikipedia has about 50 million topics. Um, Resourcium has 108. Uh, so we're a little bit behind there. Uh, Visits per month, um, 18 billion visitors to Wikipedia a month, which I just think is is crazy. I mean, that's that's how useful it is. Uh, Resourcium has about 10,000 visitors per month, so pretty good, but again, pretty far behind. Uh, but where we shine here is in journeys. Wikipedia is just a collection of knowledge. It's a collection of these resources in the form of, of text and images, which is great, um, but it doesn't connect all of that information together into stories into journeys. Resourcing, we have 38, so uh, we're, we're winning there. Um, and I'm hoping that we get more of everything going forward. Uh, so what I hope happens next for everybody here is that I'm hoping more people start to use resourcing.org to find a lot of these really good controls resources. And then more importantly, start using those resources. Um, resourcing is just a way to find them. Um, and then I want more people to start using what already exists because there's a lot of fantastic stuff out there. Um, if you want, create an account on Resourcium, start saving resources. Um, and if you're very motivated, request write access. If you have resources that you want to add or if you want to create your own journey, um, that would be great. So if you get write access, start adding resources into the database, start creating those journeys. And then again, importantly, start sharing those journeys with others. Share them with people who are teaching controls, share them with people who want to learn controls. Um, and hopefully this process will have some, some good feedback and it'll explode into something that is useful for the entire controls education community.